Hi folks, welcome to another week on false memory research. This week we're going to be talking about the foundational research in cognitive psychology that helps us think about possible memory distortions in the first lecture. Then we're going to be talking about false memory theories and then we're going to be talking about false memory research in the third mini lecture. It occurred to me that when we are figuring out how to be expert witnesses in court or how to give legal advice as a forensic psychologist, we also often draw on memory research and cognitive research outside of the area of false memories, in other words, in other words the more foundational areas of research, such as the basic models of how memory works. And uh, false memory researchers use this foundational research to plan out their um, own research in false memories and so on. So that's why I'm going to talk to you about the foundations of uh, from cognitive psychology that we use the most. And uh, before we get on to false memory research, this is something that I feel that all forensic psychologists should know. Right. You should know the basic models of how memory works. So if some kind of interview technique in a detective uh, case um, involves something that violates what we know about memory, you know, so we'll talk about this as we go along. If it involves revisiting a scene in which they were not listening to a conversation, but now they go back and listen to a conversation, in hypnosis or something, and that's going to lead to memory distortions. And as we go through this first lecture, I think you'll understand why. It also guides you in all sorts of different scenarios that you could face in uh, legal cases involving memory. So I'm planning to build a foundation first with cognitive psychology findings. False memory researchers stand on the shoulders of more basic memory and cognitive research, right? So we don't, we, we you know, we're not ungrounded. We we don't just look at Loftus and Pickrell's work um, on Lost in the Mall and then we think that that solves everything. Not at all. We look at converging evidence to figure out is it possible to go back and recreate what somebody said when we were not listening, or, you know, things like that. Um, expert witnesses need to know all of this preliminary research that I share with you in this uh, mini lecture, as well as knowing the false memory research that I'll give you in another lecture. So let's start out with some important early memory research by Ebbinghaus. You probably heard about this before. So in some of the earliest well-controlled, well-done uh, memory research, you get some good findings that last the test of time. They're still relevant today. So he had nonsense s s syllables that he himself tried to memorize. He counted the number of repetitions needed to remember the list perfectly. And then he measured savings, which was a percentage amount of time. It, it was quicker to relearn the words the second time. Savings was equal to the time that it took him to learn initially, minus the time it took him to relearn the nonsense syllable list. And of course, the longer the amount of time between learning and relearning, the less savings he would have, right? And the most important thing I want to draw your attention to here is look at the shape of the graph of Ebbinghaus's results. It is a decay curve, right? This is a very common site in memory research. Lots of different types of memory, autobiographical, you know, sensory, decay with the same shape. It's called the memory decay curve. And you can see that the percent savings went down with that shape, right? So it, it, there's a lot of, this is, this is how memory is lost, long-term memory especially. You lose a lot of the memory right at first. So there's a massive loss of memory in the first few minutes after you've um, seen something. And then if you have remembered it a few days later, then there is a slower decay of that memory, but it carries on decaying, that's the point. 
Okay, so that's foundational knowledge you need to know. Let's build on that. Let's build a house together. Now let's add on to that some research outside of memory research, which is attention research, all right? So, and even more basic than that, let's go back to the basics of cognition in visual cognition. So feature detectors are this discovery by Hubel and Weasel, where they discovered single neurons in the visual cortex responding to just one feature. In other words, everything we see is broken down completely into features in our visual cortex. It's not, you know, it's not just like we see an object and it stays in, as an object as, as it goes through the visual system. No, it's broken down into features. Each neuron is called a feature detector. It's in the visual cortex. Um, for example, you can have a feature detector for a dot. You can have another neuron that is a feature detector for a line. Another feature detector might be only triggered for a moving line. And um, there's a video there that you might want to see about feature detectors. But the only point I'm making here is this is a fantastic discovery. It's amazing. But everything's broken down into features in what we see, right? Now, the question is, how do we pull it all back together again? Well, Anne Treisman's feature integration theory is fairly supported by some research. It's been adapted since then. It's been um, added to since then. But the question is, how do we perceive the initially separated features of an event as part of being the same object? So all the features of the object we see, the rolling ball in this case, is broken down into our visual cortex. How do we pull it together? The answer is attention pulls it together. It's a very crude way of saying it, but if we pay attention to it, we pull the features together. And Anne Treisman did some research on this. So the research that she did to prove that we only pull features together if we pay attention to it, she flashed this display uh, for a fifth of a second on the screen. And then the participants were asked to report the two numbers that uh, you saw in at each location, so 1 and 8 in this case. In 18% of the trials, participants combined features incorrectly, right? So when they were not paying attention to the features of the triangles, the squares, the colors, the blue, red, when they were not paying attention to them, they incorrectly put the features back together. So the features were not put back together properly if you did not pay attention to them. So if, for example, some people would say, oh, I remember seeing a green triangle. That means they did not pull the features to together if they did not pay attention to it. So this might be imp important in the law, right? So if somebody's trying to remember something from a long time ago, and they did not pay attention to it at the time, no hypnotist or policeman can say, okay, can you go and reimagine that and put the, you know, and pay attention to it? What do you see? That is lost. That information is lost. They cannot accurately put something together in their memory that they did not pay attention to, right? So that's the point. Now, these... Um, Incorrectly putting features to together uh, in Treisman's research is called illusory conjunctions. They occur because features are free-floating at the beginning of the perceptual process, and they are combined only when we pay attention. Isn't that amazing? I love teaching this stuff. And uh, linked to that, there was another research piece of research that you may have seen where they, I don't want this video to be too long, so I'm not going to show it here, but you can look it up online, where there's a video of a gorilla and they play basketball and you have to count the number of passes between the players because you're not paying attention to anything except the passes. You don't see the gorilla walk through the video. I just want to mention this quickly. Um, and in their findings, they found that 46% of participants failed to report having seen the gorilla, depending upon how much work they had to do on concentrating on something else or paying the attention to something else, like counting the number. 
of uh, passes or even more than that. So these experiments show that when observers are attending to one sequence of events, they can fail to notice another event, even when it's right in front of them, right? So think about this in recall of a legal, in a legal case of a, of a crime scene, right? If you are not paying attention to a part of the scene, it doesn't matter how good the hypnotists or the police interviewers are, you're not going to be accurate when you try and recall something that you were not paying attention to. Do you see how all of this research kind of fits in together like a converging evidence? Well, when you come, when you when you look at the false memory research, you see how it kind of everything is pointing in the same direction, in saying that our memories are not very good. Um, a lot of information is lost at each stage, and this model here is no different. See, it's the Atkinson and Chiffron model of memory, and it's a, basically a good model. Still, it's a 1968 model but it has been adapted since you know for example uh, Baddeley came along and said that the short-term memory is not exactly as Atkinson and Chiffron said it was it's more like working memory and that's correct um, but this is a very good beginning place to ground yourself in approximately how memory works right it certainly is true that we still believe that we have short-term memory and long-term memory. It's certainly true that we lose information from one part to the other. It's true. It's still true that we pull long-term memory into short-term working memory to recall things. You know, so it's still it still is a good model to work with, and uh, just be aware that there's been quite a lot of advances since then. Um, um, if you have to testify in court, you know, just catch yourself up on what's been done since then. But this is an important way to think about memory. So you have the input, which is the sensors coming in, your sight, your hearing, and so on. And then you have the sensory memory, which registers most of your senses. A lot of information, in other words, but most of it is lost within a second in the visual system. We'll see that. In, in a second, then some, but not much, of the sensory memory goes into short-term memory. Of course, what you pay attention to goes into short-term memory, right? So it fits together. Um, you can keep things in short-term memory by rehearsal, and the short-term memory is where you pull information from. So if it's in your short-term memory, you can report upon it. Um, either because it's just come from your sensory memory or because you've pulled out of long-term memory. And things that are newly in your short-term memory, you can consolidate that over time into long-term memory. But again, there's a lot of loss of information. Most items of information in short-term memory are lost. Very important, right, for the law. Are lost completely and forever and not put into short-term memory and only a small proportion is put into long-term memory. So they found that there's three different types of memory, sensory memory, long-term memory, and short-term memory. So sensory memory is the initial stage that holds all incoming sensory information for for a sec th seconds, in in the case of hearing, you you kind of have a sensory memory of a, of a few seconds, but in vision, it's for fractions of a second, right? So less than a second, and then short term memory holds five to seven chunks of items um, uh, for about fifteen to twenty seconds, and then it's lost unless it's put into long term memory which can hold a large amount of information for years and even decades, but it decays over time. By the way, this is based on quite a lot of research that was done in the 1960s and since then. It was not just a theory that came out of nothing. It was based on um, hundreds of pieces of research on memory and attention. For example, this is part of the research that, that helped us figure out that sensory memory lasts for less than a second if we're talking about visual sensory memory. 
So in Sperling's research, they flashed on letters on the screen just for a, for a short period of time. And then people were randomly chosen to report the first, seven, second or third line of the grid. And the delay in which they were asked the question was varied over time. And if you delayed the tone for a whole second, then most of the information had faded away. If you in immediately played the tone, then most people could remember most of the items on the line that they were asked to remember. Anyway, it was a very well done experiment that found out that sensory memory fades very quickly. Equally, a seminal paper by Miller found that the capacity of short-term memory, now we're talking about that short-term memory that lasts about less than 30 seconds, usually less than 20 seconds actually, they found that the capacity was about seven plus or minus two. It's a very famous paper. So that explains why we can remember telephone numbers of length seven, but we have difficulty with telephone numbers at, at length 12 or 11, right? In research since Miller, when you block rehearsal as much as you can, then it seems that our short-term memory capacity may be actually about four items not seven when you block rehearsal. Now, important adaptation of the theory was done by Baddeley and Hitch in 1974, where they did a whole bunch of uh, research that found that short-term memory was not such a great, is not so greatly defined by Atkinson and Schifron. In fact, that part of the process is probably better called working memory because it does more than just rehearse and, and store information. They said that that part of the process has a limited capacity system for temporary storage like short-term memory, but it also manipulates information as well. So it's a very active system, not passive like Atkinson and Schifron's model, and it does complex complex tasks like comprehension, learning, and reasoning as well. And this is one of the early models of um, Baddeley and Hitches. It's been added to with uh, um, a different diagram since then. But the, the general discovery is this. They're in working memory, which is kind of like the short-term memory in our diagram, there is a central executive that does all the processing. And then there's one storage capacity called the phonological loop that stores and processes auditory information, right? So phono, phonological, um, phono means sound, so that's sound. And then you have the visual spatial sketch pad, which deals with visual information. In other words, we have these two capacities for sound in short-term memory and vision in short-term memory. And we have a capacity to work with both of those simultaneously because they're in separate sim um, systems. In other words, you can work with sound information or verbal information. It's also, you know, the verbal information of talking is done in a phonological loop. We can work with that at the same time that we're working with visual information, right? So this explains why somebody can play the guitar, which is um, visual and spatial um, control from the central executive at the same time as doing something verbal, right? Such as singing and playing the guitar together. But what we can't do, and this is part of the kind of research that discovered this by Baddeley and so on, what we can't do very well is two verbal tasks together, right? So we can listen to one conversation and then listen to another conversation at the same time. We can't do that. We can listen to one conversation and play the guitar, you know, because that's visual spatial combined with um, auditory, but we can't do two verbal things at the same time. So. It's not a good idea, for example, to listen to verbal 
music, you know, with lyrics and uh, do lectures, right? So uh, it might be possible to listen to classical music without any verbal and listen to lectures. That might work. Um, so we're limited in that sense. Now, in understanding these limitations might be important for a memory distortion expert witness, right? So you need to know this so that if somebody comes to court and says, um, yes, we hypnotize the the uh, witness, and although they were listening to one conversation at the time, we hypnotize them so that they listen to another conversation in the background, and we were able to recover memories of that conversation. No, that we we don't have that capacity. So it's good to know what capacities we have when you know judging a case, a memory case. Now, long-term memory is the final stage, of course, and that has a very large capacity, um, but it still does decay over time, even though the decay is, is uh, um, not as fast as short-term memory, and sensory memory is extremely fast. Um, it still has that same decay curve that you're familiar with. As you can see, over time, in the first instance, memory decays very quickly, and then memory decay becomes less and less over time, but it still decays, right? Never stops decaying, is the general finding. And there's lots of research that shows many, many different areas of different types of memory research that shows that same decay curve. It's, it's, it's almost magic. It's almost um, like that explains so much. For example, even the decay in people's memory for the names of presidents follows that decay curve, apart from there's some exceptions like Washington and Lincoln and so on. Um, but that is also explained by another theory um, of memory, such as primacy. So all of that is important to know when thinking about the possibility, the plausibility of memory recall in the forensic setting, right? So the more you know, the better you will be at making an informed decision and basically just passing on the research. You, you know where to look, passing on the research to the jury and the judge so that they know what to consider. So let's summarize this first mini lecture. There's a few different types of memory, such as sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. They are kind of discrete. They last different amount of times. They have different capacities. And there's a lot of information lost. So not all that is seen or heard is attended to. Any information that is not attended to is lost forever, right? So this comes from the attention research just as much as it does from memory research. Most short-term memory is lost forever after 20 seconds. Working memory has auditory and visual subdivisions. Long-term memory fades with a decay curve. And false memory researchers use these frameworks to assess a case, but we also use these frameworks to design research, right? So we think about, okay, if we give if, if we give a stimulus at time one, we want it to fade to a certain level before we give the misinformation. And then we want the misinformation to fade a little bit so they can't distinguish between the two sources of information and then we'll test them, right? So this cognitive research that I talked to you about here helps us understand false memories. And you can see that we are not relying only on false memory research when, we, when we're being skeptical about a memory re report in court. In fact, I think when we are skeptical of a memory report in court, we probably could raise doubts about it without even talking about false memory research. We could talk about foundational cognitive research like we talked about today. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, it was a revelation to me when I learned this stuff and kind of put it together, and I love the converging evidence with false memory research. I'll see you next time in the next mini lecture. Bye for now.